It's been a tough year so far for Chuck Knoll and his Pittsburgh Steelers, but perhaps things are finally on the upswing in the Steel City. A week ago, Knoll Steelers won their first game of the 1986 season, defeating AFC Central Division rival Houston on the road. The look of a winner has returned to the men of steel, and if history can be trusted, then this look should remain when this day is done. Today's opponent at Three Rivers Stadium is the Cleveland Browns, another division rival, and a team that has not won in Pittsburgh since the NFL and the AFL merged in 1970. Of course, that means that the Browns are looking for their first victory ever in Three Rivers Stadium after years of suffering. Perhaps Indiana Jones can rescue the Browns from the losing spell that has engulfed them. One man who played an active part in keeping Cleveland jinxed was former Steeler receiver Lynn Swan. Swan remembers many Sunday afternoons in Pittsburgh running under passes thrown by Terry Bradshaw and turning them into touchdowns that helped beat the Browns. Swan has since handed the reins to the multi-talented Lewis Lips, one of the NFL's finest wide receivers. But Lips has not been able to make his usual impact this season, as the Steeler offense, and particularly quarterback Mark Malone, has been unable to generate much of anything through the first four weeks. Malone is the NFL's lowest-rated quarterback, and if the Steelers are to play well, he must become a leading man. From Pittsburgh, where the Browns hope to change the course of history, it's the Pittsburgh Steelers hosting the Cleveland Browns in the NFL Game of the Week. Futility grabbed the spotlight early in this important AFC Central matchup. First, Gary Anderson of Pittsburgh, one of the NFL's most accurate place kickers, missed from 42 yards. Then, when Cleveland took over, quarterback Bernie Kosar's first pass of the game was picked off by Steelers rookie cornerback Chris Sheffield, number 41. Unfortunately for Pittsburgh, Sheffield's interception was nullified by an offsides penalty against the Steelers. What followed was more of the same. The Browns did manage to work into field goal range. But their kicker, Matt Barr, also came up empty, and the game remained scoreless through most of the first quarter. The Browns' defense, one of the league's toughest a year ago, had not performed well through the season's first four weeks. Their run defense particularly has suffered. Cleveland ranks last in the AFC stopping the run. Their pass defense has remained solid, due in large part to cornerbacks Hanford Dixon and Frank Minifield, number 31. Against Pittsburgh, Minifield turned the tide in the Browns' favor with an outstanding display of man-to-man -man coverage against Pittsburgh's Lewis Lips. Minifield's interception was the game's first big play, and it led to the initial score of this tightly contested battle. It came with just over two minutes remaining in the first period, when Kozar avoided the pass rush and lofted this perfectly thrown pass to rookie Webster Slaughter, number 84. The 15-yard touchdown gave Cleveland a 7-0 lead and is worth a second look. The play illustrates well the kind of quarterback Kozar is. He's not particularly agile or fluid in his movements, nor does he seem to possess a strong arm. Yet he manages to do the job with a minimum of mistakes. Slaughter's first NFL touchdown was only the beginning of a quarter-ending stretch that saw the Browns take charge. On the kickoff following Slaughter's score, Cleveland's special teams would grab a piece of the action, forcing Steelers return man Donnie Elder, number 37, to fumble.
When the dust cleared, the Browns had the ball deep in Pittsburgh territory and were in excellent position to add to their lead and perhaps finally end the losing streak that has haunted them since the days when Richard Nixon was president. But the Browns could not get into the end zone and they had to settle for a field goal of 22 yards by Matt Barr. The first quarter had come to an end. The play was more sloppy than crisp, but the Browns had made the ones that counted the most and they went to the second period leading by 10. The Browns have handed their present and their future to 22-year-old Bernie Kosar. Kozar may not look like the smoothest quarterback in the NFL, but he appears to possess that winning quality that separates the great quarterbacks from the merely good ones. Of course, only time will tell. But Kozar's knack, however awkward, of making something positive happen in the toughest of circumstances continued to work for him against Pittsburgh. Kozar then let something very important slip away from him, the football. It was ruled a fumble, and it was recovered by Steelers defensive end Edmund Nelson, number 64 in Cleveland territory. Midway through the second quarter, the Steelers got their first break of the game. If they hoped to stay within striking distance of the Browns, they needed to get in the end zone, and now. Running back Ernest Jackson took the ball inches away from the goal line, and then Malone finished it off, disappearing into the pile to pull the Steelers to within three, 10 to seven. The Steelers had rebounded, but they needed a lot more than a fluke fumble by the opposing quarterback to make a stand in this game. What they needed was to assert themselves on both sides of the line of scrimmage and force the action, not wait for it. They did exactly that on Cleveland's possession following the touchdown. Strong pressure on Kozar resulted in a Keith Gary sack, and the Steelers would get the ball back with three minutes left in the half. In the first four games of the season, the Pittsburgh offense had been almost invisible. The Steelers had managed to score but four touchdowns in four games, and two of them came in their only victory against the Oilers a week earlier. Up to this point, Malone has been a disappointment. His 10 interceptions are strong evidence of his inconsistency and overall weakness. But Malone came through late in the second quarter against the Browns. First, a bullet to lips, and then the go-ahead touchdown to Rich Ehrenberg. Ehrenberg, number 24, is the Steelers' finest all-purpose back, a dependable runner and receiver who seems to be at his best near the goal line. His five-yard scoring catch vaulted the Steelers into the lead at 14 to 10, with under two minutes remaining in the half. It was a lead the Steelers did not have for very long. On the ensuing kickoff, the smallest man in the NFL, Gerald McNeil, number 89, all 5'7", 140 pounds of him, raced 100 yards to return the lead to the Browns. It was the second week in a row that this pint-sized bundle of excitement and energy had gone the distance. A week earlier against Detroit, he had taken a punt and sped 84 yards to help Cleveland earn a come-from-behind victory. McNeil's thrilling touchdown ended a hard-fought yet mistake-prone first half that saw the Browns and Steelers fight and claw for every advantage. The half ended with the Browns in front 17 to 14, thanks to the giant strides of a small man. Yet a whole half remained. Too much time for Browns head coach Marty Schottenheimer to feel comfortable. Remember, Three Rivers Stadium has been a house of horrors for Cleveland. Could the Browns survive? Bernie Kozar had his team in the lead as the third quarter began. 
but it hadn't been his passing totals that were directly responsible. So the sophomore quarterback decided to correct that situation on the half's very first play. Second year wideout Reggie Langhorn, number 88, got the Browns off to a good start. But then the Steelers stalled any further gains with some stout run defense. Running the ball was something neither team could do effectively in the early stages of period three, as the Browns also kept Pittsburgh's backs in check. However, the Steelers got a break when Cleveland's Gerald McNeil, the kick returning hero in the first half, saw how quickly fortunes can change when running back punts in the NFL. Johnny Elder recovered the loose ball deep in Cleveland territory. And then Mark Malone fired a rare completion to a Pittsburgh tight end. This one to Preston Gothard, number 86. It was only the fourth catch any Steeler tight end had made this season. And then Malone looked for and found the more conspicuous Lewis Lips, number 83. Louis Leap gave him his first touchdown reception of 1986 and put the Steelers back on top. It was also only his 10th catch of the season, a far cry from his usual output. A mistake had burned the Browns and set up this score, so now they felt it would be best to stick to their conservative ground game. With big gains from Curtis Dickey and Ernest Biner, the strategy finally started to pay off. While the once dormant Cleveland ground game virtually ran at will. But inside the 20, the Steelers clamped down on Viner. And then Kozar just missed, connecting in the end zone on a pass to Langhorn. So former Steeler kicker Matt Barr calmly put through a 39-yarder and Cleveland crept back to within a point. The Browns' success, however, had showed Pittsburgh something important. The Ohioans had used up time and gained good yardage on their scoring march. Pittsburgh had the lead, so they decided they would do some running of their own. Utilizing short, safe passes to the backs and off-tackle runs, the Steelers gobbled up almost six minutes on their most impressive drive of the game. contributor was number 43, the recently acquired Ernest Jackson. In 1984 and 85, Jackson had rushed for a thousand yards with both San Diego and Philadelphia, but both teams eventually let him go. Obviously in Pittsburgh, Jackson was welcomed with open arms. As the fourth quarter began, the Steelers were within scoring range, but Cleveland defensive end Carl Hairston, number 78, put an end to any touchdown hopes. Despite the Browns' defensive stand, Pittsburgh had dominated and got three points for their trouble on Gary Anderson's field goal. With 14 minutes to play, the Three Rivers Jinx appeared to be smiling on the Steelers and frowning on the luckless Browns once again. The Browns looked to be dead in the water until the Steelers fell victim to a pair of disastrous mistakes that ultimately cost them the game. The first came on a fumble from punt returner Rick Woods, number 22. 
that breathe new life into the dormant Cleveland offense. The Browns' Mark Harper fell on the loose football, but Cleveland could not convert even one first down. So Matt Barr attempted a field goal from 43 yards. And the Steelers breathed a sigh of relief as Barr's blast sailed wide left. But then another Steelers slip-up saved the Browns. A roughing the kicker penalty gave the ball back to Cleveland. And this time the visitors were determined to cash in on their opportunity. Ernest Biner's second score of the season put Cleveland ahead, this time for good. Thanks to the Steelers' uncommon generosity and the straight-ahead thrust of the Cleveland ground game, Biner's blast was the stake through the hard play that would finally destroy the Three Rivers jinx. Biner was so stunned he temporarily lost his footing, but now the Browns were on firm ground indeed. After stuffing the Steeler attack, Kozar connected with Reggie Langhorn on the prettiest play of the afternoon. Langhorn's diving grab of 41 yards put Cleveland deep in Steeler country. And although the Browns did little after this spectacular catch, they appeared ready to put the game on ice with one more score. Kozar's fortunes were not quite so good with his short passing game, however, as he just missed connecting with Langhorn on an almost certain touchdown pass. So on came Matt Barr for an easy 24-yard field goal. There was only one problem. Barr missed. And with nearly five minutes to go, the Steelers still had a very good chance to win this game. The Three Rivers jinx would not go down without a fight, and neither would the Steelers, who didn't want Cleveland to get their hands on the football again. It was obvious to the Browns' defense just what was coming. Pittsburgh hadn't thrown deep too well and had run quite effectively. So the short pass and the run up the gut were the likely Pittsburgh play selections. And that's just what the Steelers ran against Cleveland on their last drive of the game. however, was a 25-yard toss to Calvin Sweeney, Pittsburgh's longest pass completion of the game. But just when the Steelers looked like they were rolling, they committed their third and final error of the half. And this time, they would not be saved from their own mistakes. A play with not one, but two Steeler fumbles turned the lights out for Pittsburgh. A fake into the line did not fool the Browns' Sam Clancy, number 91, who jarred the ball loose. Despite Ernest Jackson's efforts to recover, it was too late, and Cleveland had the ball. Number 37, Chris Rockins, made the fumble recovery, and the celebration was about to begin. Then Bernie Kozar iced the game for good by hitting Reggie Langhorn for yet another critical completion. Appropriately, it was Langhorn, the most productive man on the field, who made the catch that wrapped things up. Time finally expired, and Cleveland could at last pop the champagne corks for a long overdue victory party. Many Cleveland losses in the Steel City had been heartbreaking ones. Two defeats came in overtime. Three came with 10 seconds or less left to play. But now, on October 5th in the year of our Lord, 1986, the Cleveland Browns had finally come to Pittsburgh and won a football game. The victory puts the Browns in a first place tie with Cincinnati in the AFC Central. But even more important, this win ends some unfinished business for the Cleveland franchise, closing the books on a 16-year nightmare that had bedeviled the Browns. 
Such a legacy makes this one of the most meaningful wins the Cleveland Browns will ever enjoy.